was a cooperator, it's more helpful. Yeah, we're on right now. Okay. Burst into jubilant song with music. 
Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Now, if you'll all join together as we sing, O come all ye faithful.
title of the Advent devotional is Should Joy Be Given? Two weeks ago, we lit the first candle of Advent. We reflected on Jesus as the great hope of Israel and the hope of all who believe in him. We sang, O come, O come, Emmanuel, to express our longing for Christ and to know the truth that he is Emmanuel, God with us. Last week, we lit the second candle of Advent. We considered the message the angels brought to the shepherds and learned the importance of the message. They modeled for us true worship which declares glory to God in the highest. And when we give God the highest glory, we can experience his peace, his shalom, and upon us his favor will rest. We sang Hark the Herald Angels Sing to remind us of the angels' message. Today we consider joy. Isaac Watts' popular Christmas carol, Joy to the World, is a favorite of the carol of many. Yet embracing the joy of Christmas is not easy in such times as these. Holiday plans are being altered. We see the sad statistics of COVID day after day. Unemployment rises, more small businesses close, while hospitals are filled up to capacity. It all can lead us to cry out, where is the joy in all of this? In Philippians 4.4, 4, Paul commands us to rejoice in the Lord always. N.T. Wright tells us, this is better translated, celebrate in the Lord always. This is why a Christian funeral can be deemed a homecoming celebration. Even at such a sad time, we can celebrate a life well lived and rejoice in the eternal life that we will one day share. Thus, celebrating in the Lord is a choice of attitude. We can be sad. We can long for a better, happier time while being comforted in the joy of God's promises, confident in the joy of God's truth and cradled in the joy of God's love. Further in Philippians 4, Paul encourages us not to be anxious about anything. Yet we have so many things to be anxious about. It was no different for the Philippians. N.T. Wright tells us anxiety was a way of life for many of the ancient pagan world. With so many gods and goddesses, all of them potentially out to get you for, for some offense you might not even know about, they never knew whether something bad was waiting for them around the corner. But with the God who had revealed himself in Jesus, there was no guarantee against suffering, but there was the certainty that this God was ultimately in control and that he was always here and answer prayers on any topic, whatever. We can have the same certainty in these times that has brought about so, such anxiousness. And Paul gives us a way, excuse me, and Paul gives us a way to combat our anxiousness by considering what we think on when anxious feelings arise. Philippians 4, 8 gives us a list of things to think on. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Yes, keeping up with the news of the world is understandable and sticking our head in the sand is an unhealthy approach, yet allowing our minds to dwell on the darkness of this world is not healthy either. And constantly exposing ourselves to the news and media will not help us fight the darkness, but quite the opposite. Paul offers the best alternative by giving us the list to think upon. So during Advent, when the dark moments come, instead of watching the news again, perhaps we fill our ears with the music of the season and stop to listen to the truths that they confess. Joy to the world, the Lord has come! And he rules the world with truth and grace are more than just lyrics that we sing at Christmas. They're truths that we can believe in. So as we light the third candle of Advent, what 
let's express our joy as we continue to anticipate the coming of the Christ child. Will you bow with me in prayer? Joy to you, O God, for your victory in this world through your Son, Jesus Christ. And help us, whenever we face the anxiety of the times, to think on that which is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy, to help us find that joy that you have given us in our hearts. Generously to all without finding fault, 
and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away, even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Thus ends the reading. Thank you, Denise. We come together as a congregation, a time of prayer together, and uh, Jason, are you able to see the Facebook? Are you? Yeah. So if, if anybody has prayer requests at home, go ahead and put those on the Facebook chat, and Jason will let me know if, if you have a request here. Um, I, we definitely want to lift up uh, Kay Smith this morning. Kay uh, has has tested positive for COVID and is not feeling very well, and she's gone ahead and gone to the hospital, and she's getting good treatment there. They've got her on some good medicine, and she is feeling better. But we also want to pray for uh, her husband, who has tested positive, and I, I'm thinking his symptoms are fairly mild at this point, and he is at home. But then their son, Michael, who did test negative, um, does have some other concerns going on. Um, he, he is in the University Hospital in Indianapolis right now because he has pneumonia. So they're just, uh, they're having some difficulties at the Smith home right now. And we want to lift them up in prayer uh, during this difficult time. And uh, just uh, be the church to them. Send, send them your warm greetings as best you can. Um, and mostly be in prayer for them. And let us, let's be the, the church to these folks uh, this morning. Jason, Jody. Tell us in your name, God, my friends, and we just, we're going tomorrow, so prayer to the Lord Jesus. Jody Maddox is here, and she is sharing that her daughter Ella is having a lot of migraines, and so we want to lift Ella up this morning as well. So let's keep Ella Maddox in our prayers. Any, anything on the line, Jason? Okay. <clears throat> well, let's turn to the Lord together this morning as a congregation, whether at home or here in the here in the sanctuary for a time of prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time uh, in the world we, we're, we're struggling, we're wrestling, we're seeing so many folks affected by COVID and other people sick and and so many things, Lord, that uh, we, we want to ask, what's going on? What can we do? So we turn to you, Lord, and we ask for strength. We ask for peace of mind. We ask in the midst of this season, when you're, we remember that your son came to earth for our sake. We remember the joy of that. And as we as I will express in the message, and, and uh, we've already heard this morning during the Advent candle lighting, it's hard to be joyful, Lord, but we know you're not asking us to be happy about it. We know, we know you're not asking us to have, you know, cheerful emotions, but you're asking us to have, to keep an attitude of joy. Help us to know that, that you are still in control, we still have you in the center of our lives and that this is what matters. Nothing in the world is going to save us. Nothing is going to uh, come along that's, that's more powerful than your son, Jesus Christ. So we rest our trust and our, our hearts upon you. 
lift up this morning the Smith family especially. We ask your hand upon them during this time of sickness. Especially pray for Kay and the care she is getting and for Michael and the care that he is getting. And uh, help them all to stay in touch, to stay as positive as possible, especially since they all have to be split up right now, Lord. And have your hand on each one. And may the love of the people of this church be known and expressed to them in all ways possible. I lift up Kay's daughter, who's been sharing updates, and I know this has got to be difficult for her, and so, so often I know, Lord, I have felt like my hands are tied, and I can't even visit these people in the hospital, and, and just help us, Lord, to connect. Help us to be discerning about what you would have us to do as a people. I lift up Ella Maddox to you this morning as she's wrestling with, with bad migraines, and, and uh, I know that can be such a difficult thing, and, and even debilitating when you are fighting something like that, and so I pray that, uh, that uh, they find answers for that, that she gets some relief from that. Lord, I just, I just pray for all of us as we approach the Christmas season that we be aware that depression can happen because of how different it is this year and that we do as your scripture tells us to think on things that are wonderful, that are lovely, that list that, that Paul gives us in Philippians 4. To keep our minds in a good place. To keep our, our hearts and our thoughts in a good place. Help us, Lord, to do that at such a time. Now, Lord, I would ask that you would help me and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts would be holy and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock, our redeemer, and our strength. Amen. Well, we continue this morning in our Christmas carol series, if you will, for Advent. And uh, this, is, this has been fun for me, and I hope you have gleaned from it and will continue to glean from it because it, it, I feel like God has really given me some messages and has just really connected well as we've done this. And, and this morning we consider joy. We consider joy to the world as our carol for this, this morning. And I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts is the author of the words of joy to the world, and he was no stranger to adversity. He faced a lot of difficulty in his life. He, he was actually born into adversity because when he was born, his father, who was also named Isaac, was in prison. He was in prison, but not for a crime you would think of like theft or failing to pay his bills, as many were in that day. But according to Ace Collins, he was a criminal nonconformist, having been found guilty of teaching radical ideas that were not approved by the Church of England. He was a free thinker. He was a rebellious thinker, if you will, and expressing those things landed him in jail. And Isaac the Elder evidently passed on this free-thinking approach to his son. Isaac Watts, the younger, he, he was highly intellectual. And as, as they realized this, they also what came about is that they knew that under normal circumstances, his intelligence, his smarts, would have enabled him to attend one of the finer colleges in England, such as Oxford or Cambridge. But because his family was not a part of the Church of England, he was sent to a lesser independent academy. But while there, he questioned everything. He, his rebellious nature pushed back hard against the status quo. And he would beg the question, he would ask the question in general, why are people satisfied with the way things are when, they, when things could be so much better? And Isaac, he did well at the academy. He did well at school. But after he was done, he did return home to live again under his father's roof at the age of 20. 
And young Isaac continued to push back, continued to resist the status quo. And this time, though, his main rub was against the music of the church. He found the standard songs of church music very uninspiring and lacking the joy he desired to express in his own faith. <clears throat> Sound familiar? <laughs> uh, he constantly complained to his father about the archaic psalms they would sing service after service after service. Well, the elder Watts, perhaps seeing much of himself in his son, instead of fighting with him or arguing with him, he challenged his son with this simple notion. If you are so un uninspired by the songs of the church, perhaps you should author some that are better. Well, young Isaac Watts accepted this challenge. And again, according to Collins, this challenge initiated a creative burst that would not end until Isaac had authored more than 600 hymns and hundreds of other poems. At first, his music, though, was received with contempt. More adversity for Isaac. But he was not one to give up, as you could imagine. And career-wise, he chose to, he had the opportunity eventually to take an, an assistantship with an independent chapel, again, not the Church of England. And, and this eventually led to him becoming the pastor of that chapel. And due to his work ethic and his new ideas, the church grew, and Isaac Watts became a highly regarded pastor in England. And through this, he was able to publish some of his, his music lyrics and other theological writings as well. Now, there was a lady, a young lady that was inspired by his written work. And this young woman wrote to him, and Isaac Responded, and they began this correspondence. Now, this young lady, her name was Elizabeth Singer. She was so enamored with Isaac's writings and, the, and their, their correspondence that she proposed to him in marriage, sight unseen, via their correspondence. And Isaac Watts, in return, accepted her uh, proposal. But sadly, when they Came when they were finally united face to face, the young lady, believe it or not, beholding the sight of poor Isaac, broke their engagement and went back home. She later said this of Isaac. He was only five feet tall, with a shallow face and a hooked nose, prominent cheekbones, small eyes, and a death-like color. How sad. Another adding yet one more difficult time in Isaac's life. To the point that he would never love again. He never married because of how wounded he was by what Elizabeth did to him. And though he was wounded, though he had all of these adversities, he never gave up the fight for more meaningful and moving church music, even amidst the constant criticism, ridicule of others. And today... If you would look at our hymnal, you would find 15 of Isaac Watts' songs in our hymnal, some of which you may be familiar with. Songs like, When I Survey the Wonders Cross, O God, our help in ages past, I sing the mighty power of God at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And of course, joy to the world. Joy to the world. His, his perseverance should inspire us all. And Isaac Watts provides for us a real-life example of the scripture that we are focusing on today. We are looking to the book of James, starting with the second verse of the first chapter. Now, it is interesting to me because what James says here is very similar to one of my favorite passages, which is Romans 5, starting in verse 3. Let me read Romans 5, 3 through 5 to you. <clears throat> we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. Or a better translation there is perseverance. And perseverance or endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. 
For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So I don't know what happened here somehow. Is it possible that James learned from Paul this teaching or Paul learned from James this teaching? James, the author of this James, is, is, is supposedly, possibly the brother of Jesus that is credited with authoring this book. Uh, or, or were both of these, both of these uh, pillars of the faith inspired distinctly and separately from one another by the Spirit of God? But to me, we have this evidence and, and this similar teaching in both places, and so we really need to take it seriously. But the difficulty is, it's a hard teaching. It is a hard thing to grasp. I mean, in our human nature, our flesh, we don't want to be joyous when we face difficult things. We have tests, we have trials. But both James and Paul are telling us this is a way to rise above. And both of them tell us when we seek joy in hard times, we're going to be better for it. We will develop perseverance. We will develop an enduring, what I think of as a, a, an enduring next level patience, a, a next level stick to itiveness. And Paul, from there, he says this, this builds character, right? And is it, he uses the term strength of character. Char and this character gives us hope, a greater hope in our salvation. Now, like I said, I, I love this passage and the, the one thing leads to another of, this, of it. And, and I've, I've actually preached on it. It's been a couple of years, but I've preached on it before. But we're going to look at James today and where he takes this idea is so interesting. And, and we're going to look at his take more closely. So first off, we note how, how James clarifies the trials that we face in, in James 1.3. He says they are a testing of our faith. That's an interesting idea for us. Uh, uh, and we need to understand that what tests are, are, are things that are made to strengthen us. Some, some young people may think, oh, tests, I hate tests. But tests are a good thing. And we as adults can understand this too because we go through training. We might be tested on some things that we're trained on. We go through practices. We go through, the, you know, if you're all part of a team as a young person or even uh, uh, <coughs> recreationally, it, you go through practice. You know, our teachers, our bosses, our mentors, our coaches, if they want us to succeed, they will push us. They will test us why? So we are ready. We are ready for whatever comes next. So it might be hard to believe, but us going through difficult circumstances, trials, if you will, tests, if you will, is a sign that God cares. He really cares about us because he is allowing us to be pushed and to grow so we are ready for whatever comes next. As N.T. Wright puts it, when a Christian is tested, it shows something real is happening. Something is real is going on in their life. And let's be clear, tests come in many forms, and, and they don't always come directly from God, because God never uh, is one that creates for us temptation. But they come, sometimes they come from worldly things, where, where he freely gives us that choice to choose it or not. Tests can be health issues. Tests can be a loss of someone, be it through death or simply a broken relationship like Isaac Watts experienced. <clears throat> For many Christians in the world in James' day and Christians in the world now, not necessarily in the U.S., it can be persecution for our faith. There are places in the world where it is illegal to be a Christian. Or, like I mentioned, it can be a fierce temptation. It could be financial temptation. It could be financial troubles, if you will. But if I can again quote N.T. Wright, you wouldn't be tested unless you were doing something serious. Think of the testing they've been doing on, on these vaccines. Companies wouldn't go to the final stages 
the final testings, unless they were really confident, if they were, they were really serious about it. So that, so that these medicines, when, when they go through the test and they are successful in testing, these medicines are prepared for what's next, which is use among the general population. And like Paul says, well, and, and like Paul, James says, the result of these tests is perseverance. We persevere. N.T. Wright <coughs> it, it translates this perseverance word as patience. So I think of it as the benefits of a long obedience, a, a remaining strong, and the remaining of, of being strong and consistent, and we do so in the same direction. I love the phrase, a long obedience in the same direction. This is what perseverance looks like. And, and James chapter 1 verse 4 in the NIV says, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. So where Paul says it's a strength of character, your perseverance, your resolve to remain joyful because of what God has done, is doing, can become a key part of who you are. It helps you become more complete, as James puts it. And this is good stuff. This is where we need to be going. This is, this is the direction God has for us. And I have no doubt, this is how someone like Isaac Watts kept going. Kept taking one step forward, keeping in the same direction. He believed in, in Christ, and he believed who God had made him to be. A minister, a wordsmith, and a Christian music innovator. And in that, he found joy, even in the midst of these trials that he faced. And you notice this is the case with Isaac Watts. Sometimes the resistance comes from those who are supposed to be on the same team. Isaac Watts got most of his resistance from other Christians who did not approve of his music. Isn't that interesting? Now James shifts gears here when we get to verse 5. But, if, but a few verses later we're going to see what he's doing and the direction he ends up and comes for, for full circle. Notice he ends verse 4 saying, all this leads to maturity, not lacking anything. But then there's this big but. But, but, if any of you lacks wisdom, he or they should ask God, who gives generously without finding fault, and it will be given to him or them. Understanding that when they used he and him, they meant man, humankind. And James knew that a key part of this process uh, of maintaining our joy attitude, of, of developing patient perseverance over the long haul, it, it's going to take some wisdom. And he also addresses a common attitude we likely all have about asking God for things. If I ask for wisdom, what is God going to give it? Maybe he's only got uh, so much that he wants to give. Maybe he thinks I don't deserve it. But James answers the question before it is asked, reinforcing that this joy, this perseverance, this patience thing is an attitude we choose, not some fleeting emotional response. See, we have a tendency to, what happens is we reflect our weaknesses and think that, it's in, that that is how God's persona is. We reflect our insecurities about ourselves and think God might be like that too. We think I'm not smart, or at the very least, I don't deserve God's wisdom, so maybe he's not going to give it to me. Maybe he's like that too. And sometimes people are stingy with their own smarts. Have you ever met anybody like that? I knew some in college for sure. Some have this attitude, well, I figured all this out on my own. I studied hard and came up with the answers. Why should I make it easier on you? So, And we may reflect, maybe God thinks like that. We reflect those attitudes on God, and subconsciously we think, well, God is the same way, but he isn't. He is not. We need to think God more like that generous mentor who wants to pass on their knowledge, who understands we're human beings. We're going to make mistakes. We are not perfect, but we deserve the help anyway. But then, in 
verses 6 through 8, James gets firm. And he says, if you are going to believe in this, believe in it. Let me catch up the slides here. <clears throat> believe in God's wisdom. <clears throat> we can't be like the waves in the sea, being wishy-washy, going back and forth about our feelings on this. And to me, this reminds me of a guy named Blaise Pascal. And he lived centuries ago, and I've spoken of Pascal's theories before, but it's worth mentioning again. See, Pascal was this scholar and this theologian, but he also he had a, an amazing scientific mind. And, and this is a very simplified version, if you will, of one of his theological stances. Pascal basically expressed this. He says, I, I would rather believe and believe passionately in God with all I have, even if it turns out that I'm wrong. Because if I'm wrong, what have I really lost? Because I'll be dead. And so will everyone who thought I was wasting my time on faith. So they won't have benefited any by being right either. And they won't be around to tell me I was wrong. But if I'm right, and I know I'm right, what a glorious and everlasting experience that will be. So Pascal is saying, believe with all you've got, because there's really nothing to lose by doing so. And this is what James, I think, is saying to us as well. Don't be wishy-washy about faith, about God giving you wisdom. Just believe that God's going to do it if you ask. Now James then takes it another step further. And he gives examples of what this looks like. And he does it in a real personal way because he talks about our wealth, our pocket. Listen to this not-so-easy teaching he shares in verses 9 through 11. Believers, humble, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away, even while they go about their business. Wow, James is saying, take pride in the position of being poor. Hmm. And when you're rich, take pride when you are humiliated. Because when that wealth is taken from you, be it from an earthly way or when you pass away, it, it, you can't take it with you. You're not going to have it. That money is like the wildflowers. Here today and gone to tomorrow. We are like the wildflowers. Here today and gone tomorrow. As a matter of fact, N.T. Wright tells us James is connecting this, what he's saying here, to back to a passage in Isaiah. This is Isaiah 40, 7 through 8. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. I mean, all of this isn't saying that wealth is, is bad, that money is evil. I mean, money is a neutral thing. But what can steal our joy our, our joyful attitude is how we look at money versus our attitude about God and His Word. Because, again, we can't take the money with us. Because when we go, it's going to be us and God and all the rest of the believers. And, and God's got the rest covered. We're not going to need the money anymore. And the sooner we figure all that out, it's going to benefit us that much more. I tell you what, it's hard to be joyful when all you're worried about is money, isn't it? Just think of the Ebenezer Scrooges of the world. 
Yes, Ebenezer Scrooge is a fictional character, but we relate so well to that story because we know people like that, and maybe there's a little bit of us, a little Ebenezer Scrooge in all of us. But at the heart of what James is saying is this. Don't get caught up in the snares of the world. And money can be a big snare, trapped by wealth. Other snares can be, uh, you think life isn't fair, so why bother? You think maybe some, some poli political stance or some politicians can save us. Well, science, maybe science can save us. Some, some medicine is going to cure all of your ills. No. Trust in God and his word, which as Isaiah says, endures forever. And here's where James comes full, full circle in verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Reward is, is the crown, the, the well done, good and faithful servant. You know, we don't, we don't have to live a perfect life to experience heaven. But God challenges us to grow in faith because of the benefits it will have for us on earth and in heaven. You know, what James said, what, what Paul said in these passages, it all, it all came from their relationship with God, the belief in Christ and their relationship with him. And, and from a balcony view, looking at it all, God is calling us to look at things a little different than the world. He's calling us to look at the world upside down. He's calling us to look at the world inside out. We are called to think, believe, live counterculturally. At the heart of this is learning to love, to think, to live as Christ does. And rest assured, we can you can look at that scripture and see how countercultural Jesus was. He did these things. He turned things upside down, inside out counter to the world. But when we live this way, when we seek this out, we are going to find joy. Unspeakable joy. Even when it feels like your, your world is going to hell in a handbasket, there is still joy to be found. So I challenge you. I challenge you to live in such a way. Consider those you know who have a faith that seems to be joyful, in spite of whatever's going on in their life. Those who have a faith that not only has survived, but thrived. A persevering faith that doesn't ebb and flow like waves in the sea. And think on Isaac Watts. I mean, what would have happened if he hadn't lived against the grain? What would have happened if the adversity he faced led him to to allow his attitudes just to fade into the status quo and accept things as they are. For one thing, our hymn would be smaller and our Christmas celebrations and our worship services at this time would be minus one of the greatest Christmas anthems ever known. Joy to the world. So, my brothers and sisters, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Take these words of James, of Paul, of God, and endeavor to live them out all of your days. And we're going to give you opportunity, again, to express your willingness, whether here or at home, to do so. To say, I'm ready to embrace the attitude of joy. And you can do so by singing with us. Joy to the world. The Lord is coming.
joining us this morning, wherever you are for, for worship here at the Federated Church of Brookston. I do have a, a couple of quick announcements. I want to let the chaos kids know we are planning to have a, a Zoom Christmas gathering today at 3 o'clock. You'll get that invitation via text here in a little bit. I will send that out. We're just going to hang out and visit for a little bit, but also I'm working on us having kind of a tri Christmas trivia uh, game on Zoom. I'm still working out the logistics of that, but uh, that should be fun regardless. Um, you can laugh at me trying to work with technology anyway. So, but that's going to happen at 3 o'clock, and so make sure to join us. And you'll, like I said, you'll get that invitation via text. And so... If you want to do it on your computers, I'm also going to give you the uh, the uh, the number for the uh, for the meeting, so you can just plug that into your computer as well. We do have a trustees meeting via Zoom this Wednesday at seven o'clock. So, having said all that, I hope you are doing the best you can and, and are staying as healthy as possible. And uh, we appreciate you being a part of worship here at Federated Church. And to those that are here as well, thank you. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll say goodbye online. Gracious God, thank you for the spirit and attitude of joy that we can have. Knowing there are times when we're going to be unhappy. But help us to keep in mind that happiness is a fleeting emotion. Unhappiness, sadness is a fleeting emotion. But we can have this spirit of joy, resting in the truths that you have given us, that will help us to persevere, that will strengthen our character, that will help us to come closer and closer to maturity, lacking none. And the hope that that brings of a deeper understanding of your salvation for us. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this. In such times as these, we pray it passionately, for we need it so. In your son's precious name, amen. We'll see you all next Sunday, or if I see you somewhere else, we'll see you then.